often you can hear an idea and think, well, well, how did that impact upon the world? How did that make an impact? And there is no doubt that uh, social Darwinism had an impact on the world in various ways. Um, the first one I would talk about is the robber, are, are the robber barons, is the robber barons. Uh, my grammar's gone completely to pot uh, in the USA. Uh, Spencer was incredibly popular in the USA. He used to go on speaking tours over there. It was one of his ways of making a lot of money. He sold a lot of books. He had a lot of engagements. And he became the favoured theorist of people like, who have we got here, Andrew Carnegie, industrialist, financier and philanthropist, a believer in uh, the fit and respectable uh, society. Um, what, do, what does anyone know about Carnegie? He's a steel baron. Yeah. yeah. Very wealthy. What do you, what, anything else? He certainly did. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, Carnegie Hall, libraries, you know, programs of improvement. Um, even if you go to places like Dunfermline in Scotland, which is where Carnegie was born, um, you will find part of the Carnegie uh, philanthropic uh, enterprise. Uh, now, basically, for people like Carnegie, and who are the fellows that developed the railways? The Rockefellers were bankers, and who are the railway mob? Come on, help! <laughs> I've even helped me. <laughs> okay, well, you have a think about that, and then come back to me. Because as you can tell, my grasp of US history is not all that it could or should be. Um, these guys, they believe in unfettered capitalism. They believe that there should be no intervention. They believe that capitalism is an... Sorry, yep. Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, that's one. Yep, yep. Uh, definitely one of the robber barons. So, so Darwinism gives them a biological argument that justifies um, nobody interfering with their business, with them being able to do what the hell they wanted, when they wanted. Um, it allows them to you know, uh, crush unionism, if that's what they want to do. It, it argues that the market should be unimpeded, because that is nature. That is the way that nature is. And yet you get people like Carnegie, who put millions and millions of dollars into philanthropic um, enterprises. Now that is because he believes that sometimes capitalism does a bad deal with people that have talent. So he wants to provide a form of safety net to those workers that he regards as respectable, those workers that he believes want to improve themselves. So he will build institutes with libraries to encourage these individuals to improve themselves. So we actually see a bit of the social Lamarckism um, that is inherent in Spencer uh, coming out in the philanthropic exercises of individuals like Carnegie. Um, but there is no doubt, whether we call it social Darwinism or social Spencerianism, um, that it validates the activities of the robber barons. Underlying it all, this notion of laissez-faire, let it be. Let the market do its stuff. Don't interfere. Um, now, it has to be said that we've already seen that Spencer himself had this utopian bent, this belief that um, we would become, you know, population growth would just naturally decline as we as organisms became more and more complex. Um, for, for Spencer, um, unfettered capitalism was just a phase. In the end, we'd uh, end up with this civilised anarchy where government was unnecessary and all people would be able to get what they needed. But that was sometime in the future. Um, the other places to look, and we've already talked about this in some detail, uh, is the social Darwinian state. Uh, that non-regulatory Malthusian state where there is no um, welfare network uh, to pick up the needy, where minimal provision 
leads to the development of these uh, quasi-prisons, the workhouses, um, that were designed to deter people from seeking relief and to imprison those who could not care for themselves. Um, But it is also true um, that as this is panning out, and the word race becomes applicable to all sorts of different groups, not just skin colours, but countries, the Germanic races, the Anglo-Saxon races. And the state recognises that in the competition between the Germanic races and the Anglo-Saxon races, it's bloody nonsense when you think about it. I mean... No, closer, genetically closely related, in, incredibly. But this was the way that the rhetoric panned out. Um, they realised that in this battle, that they need to keep a healthy population. And this is the point at where social Darwinism is going to tip into um, things like eugenics uh, and into militarism. But it could also cut in other ways. It could cut towards pacifism. Um, Ernest Haeckel, who we'll see later on, uh, was a great proponent of both Darwin and social Darwinism. Um, He's a philosopher that was said to deeply influence Nazi philosophy, and yet he was a pacifist. And the reason that he was a pacifist is that he believed that war provided negative selection. What was that? That's okay. (laughs) So I thought it was someone outside. Negative selection. In other words, the fittest young men, the biologically fittest young men, and the bravest go to war, most likely to get killed. So there was this concern that warfare itself would uh, have this negative Darwinian impact upon the race. And then, as I've alluded already... There is the notion of the dying races where the struggle for existence is seen as a struggle between the vigorous Anglo-Saxons and the less vigorous indigenous peoples of the empire. And here it could be used to justify all sorts of different things. It could be used to justify um, the, um, the, the, the level of violence deployed against indigenous peoples. It could be used to justify colonialism, uh, particularly the scramble for Africa. Now, there were complexities. People like Wallace, who believed that the Dayaks were deeply civilised and incredibly sophisticated individuals, and increasingly anthropology will go into a relativist realm. At this point, I need to insert a fourth strand, a very, very important strand that relates to both social Darwinism and eugenics, gender and sexual differentiation. Both were absolutely critical to Darwinian theory, but also flowed out from Darwinism into political and social theory. What follows was taken from a lecture given to the Reason class this year about women's historically constructed lack of reason. It demonstrates that, particularly after the publication of The Descent of Man in 1871, evolutionary theory had a dramatic impact upon the way that gender in relation to power was constructed. Here, we must remember that for much of history, women were treated as second-class citizens, denied property rights, Upon marriage, they effectively became part of their husband's chattels. We must remember, too, that women's roles were circumscribed, that for middle and upper class women in particular, the expectation was that they would breed, bring up children and manage the household. The expectation was that women would be confined to the domestic sphere, while men strutted their stuff in the public world of business, law, politics and the like. Inevitably, then, any biological theory that emphasised how the separate spheres of men and women came into being and naturalised those spheres within a scientific framework was going to be a powerful resource in debates about a woman's place. As we will see towards the end of this subject, this remains a very live issue for some evolutionary psychologists. The rest of us have moved on. 
Of course, the late 19th century also saw the emergence of the first wave of feminism as the rule of patriarchy was challenged and demands were made and then won for equal property and political rights. For both those that campaigned for equality and those that resisted it, biology, particularly Darwinian biology, was a rhetorical resource of considerable power. And in more than any other area, with the exception of thinking about race and ethnicity, the biological nature of sexual differentiation was where Darwinism and power melded to a point where biology and politics could barely be distinguished. Gender and race were at the heart of the creation of a Darwinian biopolitics, particularly in the realm of eugenics, a factor that will be explored in the next module and the subjects that follow. The other factor that needs to be highlighted here is the development in Darwin's thinking between the publication of Origin in 1859 and Descent in 1871. As you'll remember, in Origin, Darwin was incredibly coy about the place of man. In fact, he only mentioned it a couple of times. The same, of course, could not be said for the rest of the world. In fact, the only thing that anyone seemed to be interested in was the relationship between man and chimpanzees or man and gorillas. Certainly, Darwin's supporters, particularly Huxley, were forward in examining humans' place in nature. Darwin finally decided to take up the cudgels in dissent and then in 1872, the following year, the expression of emotions in man and animals. In both works, Darwin clearly elaborated a deeply influential view that human inequalities in race and gender were the product of evolutionary inheritance. Now with sexual selection, we can see here an example of what Darwin thought. It's a struggle for existence, but between males for possession of females. You know, the result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. Sexual selection is therefore less rigorous than natural selection. Generally, the most rigorous males, those which are best fitted for their places in nature, will leave most progeny. But in many cases, victory will depend not on general vigour, but on having special weapons confined to the male sex. A hornless stag or a spurless cock would have a poor chance of leaving offspring. Sexual selection by always allowing the victor to breed might surely give indomitable courage, length to the spur and strength to the wing to strike in the spurred leg, as well as the brutal cockfighter who knows well that he can improve his breed by careful selection of the best cocks. How low in the scale of nature this law of battle descends, I know not. Male alligators have been described as fighting, bellowing and whirling round like Indians in a war dance for the possession of females. Sexual selection is the struggle between the individuals of one sex, generally the males, for the possession of the other sex. Male-male competition, the toughest gets the girl. Female selection, the handsome boy gets the girl or the man with the beard gets the girl. But for some reason in humanity, the equation is reversed because generally the male gets to choose. So what sexual selection explained for Darwin was useless or seemingly useless characteristics like the peacock's tail or the elk's horns in humans, race, hairlessness in women, beards in men, and much more besides, and perhaps even more than natural selection. Sexual selection acts in a less rigorous manner the advantages which favoured males have derived from conquering other males in battle or courtship, etc., etc. So what I wanted to suggest was that in The Descent of Man, Darwin has a very Victorian construction of gender. For him, man is aggressive, pugnacious, courageous, dominant, powerful. Women, passive, timid, modest, and also not possessed of the same level of reason. Women accept the victor over the vanquished. Sexual selection establishes a strict hierarchy where women react to the action of men. And we can see these ideas coming out in scientific thinking during this period, during the 1860s and 1870s. This is a guy called Paul Broker. There's still an area of all of our brains named after this guy. 
And he believed that sexual selection and gender impacted upon the way that our society was structured and the fact that women should be less reasonable. Women should be in the home. Women were not capable of striding across the world in the reasoned, powerful fashion that men were able to do. I think this is one of my favourite quotes from a guy called Alan J. McGregor. McGregor. Uh, get my rolled R's right, on the real difference in the minds of men and women. Now, obviously, that isn't Alan J. McGregor. I couldn't find a picture of him, so I put a Highlander up there. With this. <laughs> Writing in the Journal of the Anthropological Society of London, had this to say, in the animal and vegetable kingdom, we find this invariable law, rapidity of growth, inversely proportionate, to the degree of perfection of maturity. The higher the animal or plant in the scale of being, the more slowly does it reach its utmost capacity of development. And this is actually all to explain why boys develop more slowly than girls. Girls are physically and mentally more precocious than boys. The human female arrives sooner than the male of maturity and furnishes one of the strongest arguments against the alleged equality of the sexes. The quicker appreciation of girls is the instinct or intuitive instinct, intuitive faculty in operation, while the slower boy is an example of the latent reasoning power not yet developed. Compare them in afterlife, when the boy has become a young man full of intelligence and the girl has been educated into a young lady reading novels, working crochet and going into hysterics at the sight of a mouse or a spider. You can see the way that these ideas can get recycled from science into society and to strengthen the idea that one gender possessed reason less than another. I really wouldn't want you to take this as being too monolithic. Thinking at that time, was there was a lot of conflict over ideas. People could take a scientific theory and they could use it in all sorts of different directions rhetorically. So it was quite possible to take Darwin's theory of sexual selection and say there's one thing that Darwin got wrong. If he looked at the evidence properly, he would see that women were actually superior to men. And we do find this going on within various critiques of sexual selection during this time. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, was never a fan. John Stuart Mill went back to that older tradition of the blank slate of John Locke, suggesting that education was the key factor. And if we educated the genders right, there would be equality between the sexes. But then there were some feminists who believe in evolution who ran that counter-argument against it. This is Eliza Burt Gamble who said, after a careful reading of The Descent of Man, I first became impressed with the belief that the theory of evolution as enunciated by scientists furnishes much evidence going to show that the female among all the orders of life, man included, represents a higher stage of development than the male. In other words, she was trying to give reason back to women and suggest that they possessed more reason than men. And of course, if you go back to the characteristics that Darwin had given to the male of any species of things like pugnaciousness, you could certainly turn that on its head and say that a lot of pugnaciousness is unreasonable. I like the fact that it came out through the uh, New York feminist press, the Knickerbocker Press. This was, of course, the era of a revolution in underwear, particularly women's underwear, and feminists chose to adopt the Knickerbocker 